sorry, whenever you're ready. We are go. All right, so you know, I talked with um, a really good FOIA, a really great FOIA activist, actually, um, who I don't know that they want me to reveal that. So I'll just leave it as what some of their insights were. Um, I mean, our standard policy is all data paid for by the public should be online. Uh, with personal privacy exceptions, and that includes all branches of government. Currently, the legislature and the executive are exempt from FOIA. FOIA is the Freedom of Information Act. Um, the way it is now, we have two different, we have the Secretary of State overseeing whether um, a part of the government, either local, state, or county, is um, Compliant with FOIA, uh, whether you know if someone requests, uh, if someone requests the data be, that uh, records be given to them, um, the Secretary of State's office that can rule and say yes, uh, this agency is not in compliance. Uh, however. The Secretary of State's office can only send that to the Attorney General's office to then use legal means of getting that agency or town government into compliance. This creates a contradiction. If it's a state agency, you are in essence paying a state agency, uh, the AG's office, to prosecute another agency that may in fact be represented by the Attorney General's office. So the recommendation is to instead um, change it from a legal process to if, if, uh, if an agency, if an executive, if the legislature, if a town government is not in compliance with the law, then there are automatic fine, if, if they're found not to be in compliance, then a consolidated agency would then levy automatic fines on them until they become compliant, uh, until they are in compliance with the Freedom of Information Act. Additionally, that money could then be used to bring agencies or town governments into compliance technologically. Remember, our goal is all the information should be available online. So those fines wouldn't be used as a slush fund for this agency but would instead be turned around and plowed back into um, other agencies that are not putting their data, making their data available so that they would now be um, able to put that information um, you know, out there. Um, it would have, the agency would have regulatory power, could set guidelines and rules, and would be able to, of course, review other agencies, town governments, things like that, um, and call them out, uh, maybe not shame them, uh, but. Well, you're saying using fines to bring agencies into about, compliance. Um, other agencies fun? and hold them accountable. Okay. Hold them accountable for non-compliance. Were saying. So what I was saying was using fines to bring those agencies into compliance. Wouldn't those fines, at least a portion of those fines, be used to bring them into compliance? Mm -hmm. Meaning that we're going to hit you for ten dollars, at least eight of those dollars going into making sure that we don't have to hit you for another ten dollars. Yeah, I mean potentially. So I mean, like the example would be, um, you have some agency that hasn't automated their workflow in such a way that the data, once once decisions, once um, meeting records, for example, uh, are signed off on, they are just put out automatically onto a website, right? Um, some activist comes along and says, I want all of your meeting records. And they say, well, we can't give them to you, or, or Maybe they say um, they just don't respond, right? So now, now that individual can go to the agency and say, hey, according to the rules, I put in a request for them. 
they haven't gotten back to me in the required number of days, you need to do something about it. That agency then goes and says, okay, well, they go, they go to the, the um, part of the government that, isn't, that hasn't provided the documents and say, okay, for every day that you are non-compliant, we are going to charge you $100 or $1,000 or, or whatever. Whatever it takes to get the job done. Right. And then, you know, then maybe they amass, you know, a couple thousand dollars, which they can then go back and fund that agency to get into compliance so that stuff is automatically made available. Or, you know, I mean, part, part of the guidelines and rules are, you know, um, you know, technologies or vendors that have been used that have been found effective in the past. Hopefully open source technologies. Alright, so I'm just putting the information up online. It needs to be like machine readable, automated to like get. You don't have to click every single thing to get down more. Go to the next page. But it's gonna to take two hours and hours. So you should be able to just plug it into a program. Right, and I remember, you know, we had one issue on one of the uh, town committees I'm on where, you know, we needed to know, okay, where have they had, where has our city, uh, where have, where have uh, companies gone before the city to say, hey, we want to put a conduit in on this segment of road? The only way to find that is to go back through all of the city council notes and find out, like, search for conduit, <laughs> which hopefully is the right word in that case, and then be able to find the particular streets they're talking about. That's not yeah, that's not machine readable. I mean, it can be, but it's it's not easily readable. Um, Machine-readable, searchable. Well, one thing um, Massachusetts has a habit of doing, at least, see, or some agencies in Massachusetts have a habit of doing, are posting documents that are just scans. Yeah. Uh, so there's you, or so what you do is you get an image of, you know, you could read it, but you know, there's no, there's no OCR, or there's you know, no, no ability to to do a textual search through it. Um, it, it, it's almost like there should be all the, the, the systems that need to submit data to be compliant have to use some um, open source and supportable, maintainable process. You know? mm -hmm. If they all have to need, if they all need a scanner that can scan more than three hundred DPI, I think this falls into getting the scanner. You know, right. I falls into, I guess, providing. I'm going to like, well, so the, there's the setting guidelines and rules and I guess like best, best practices and things like that, but with this agency also responsible for uh, working with, like, so um, to how, like, how, what, what level of support would you give to, with this agency be giving to other uh, organizations, uh, to other parts of the government or local regional governments to, to implement these? Um, well, so for example, it, it might be um, <clears throat> you, you have some text-based um, trove of data. It's like, here, here's free software you can use, and here's a how-to guide, or, or here's an agency that used it with a case study and how they used it. Or here is a vendor, here is the vendor who helped them with information on how much it costs and how many documents and, and things like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's just, I guess, giving the basic idea yeah, of the staff information that they can uh, they basically use their own budget or, or their own resources to, to do the actual implementation. Well, so, if there's enough money, then, then theoretically this agency could help to fund it. <coughs> 
I mean, it depends, you know, I mean, if there, there's a lot of them aren't in compliance, it could be many millions of dollars, but at the same time, you know, it's like, how would they, that's, that's a determination, how do they pick and choose who they're going to give the money to? What branch would this fall under? Would this be judiciary, would this be the, the House of Representatives Senate, or would this be more of a, uh, more of the, like, would it fall under the federal system, or would it fall under? This would be Massachusetts. So, what, what so all of Massachusetts. Massachusetts. So this is a state, state program. Um, so the, uh, so the, the suggestion was that, so the legislature, as I mentioned previously, is 80% Democratic. The governor, for better or for worse, shifts between the two parties, the two large parties. You mean Mr. Baker? Yes, but before Baker, we had Salucci, right? And uh, before him, we Patrick. had Weld. Yeah. They were all just as... I mean, in terms of Republicans, I don't mean, obviously. But, yeah. uh, but the... <clears throat> So if it's appointed by, so the thought was, if it's appointed by the governor, there'll be kind of an incentive uh, for it to actually do its work. Where if it's appointed by the legislature, probably less likely. I mean, potentially it could be another office that is elected by the people. Of course, you know, then we get into the Galvin's been in office for over 20 years, so, you know, I'm not, maybe for terms of one year, I mean, terms of four years, something like that. Maybe the governor could select a bunch of people and we choose them by lot, I don't know. <laughs> we don't choose them by, I don't know. But the point is it needs, it's, you know, we've got, But again, um, so this would be state, state, a state agency of Massachusetts that we're looking to create. Correct. These are Massachusetts. And uh, what, what branch of the government would it fall? Executive. Okay, this would be assuming it's assuming it reports to the governor, it would, fun, it would fall under the executive. So okay, so under governor appointed, governor elected. I would say this. Appointments should be elected by the people still. Um, I wouldn't want to put that much control under the governor uh, for an agency that's about slapping the other hands at the agency. Mm -hmm. I'd see this more of like a sheriff thing. How about um, that the head of the agency appointed by the governor uh, but with the approval of the legislature? Well, I think, I think all those have to be approved by the legislature. Yeah, see, I'm more about trying, if we're, if we're pushing for this agency, then why not push with our ideas to be elected by the people? No, I, I, don't, I don't disagree with you. Um, the problem that I see is in this state, for these lower level offices, they're seldom, if ever, competitive. And, you know, unless we had a term limit of four years or eight years or whatever, you could have someone in that office for 20 years. That may be a good thing if they're really good. Yeah. It could be a bad thing if they're not. Right, and that's, yeah, I mean, I, I think maybe we should, the Office of Campaign and Political Finance may be a model to look at um, because they do seem to do their job fairly well. Yeah. So. I mean, that's, again, this is more I like. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I think we need to think on it as a possible one to chew on. One to chew on. Um, and again, I don't want anyone to think that this is set in stone. Uh, all the documents we do typically tend to be living documents, um, whereas if there's we can vote on it, we can change it. Any member can argue a point or another point. As we were discussing, me and Jamie are going back and discussing right now, um, I openly welcome any point that I say something that's not fully thought out for you to go ahead and smite me. I'm trying to give up smoking. Mm. Well, you only try to give up smoking. 
Is it 2008? Well, the, the, the federal government created uh, a position, a, a chief technology officer, right? And it was, it was the open initiative, it was open government, and probably not funded under Trump, but yeah. No, okay, so <laughs> this, the, the timeline was basically uh, someone in the private sector, I think they were, they were like chief security, chief IT of, uh, of Disney, maybe more, I mean, at the time. Mm -hmm. They they did a good job, by big quotes, meaning that they're not a uh, Joe Schmo off the street that didn't really have to compete with the spot to do data.gov, every state data.gov, mass.data.gov. Um, so now, under this administration, did we have a banker in there now? And That's she's terrible. pushing to put, <laughs> she's pushing to put everything into these. Uh, her she used to work at VM and, and VMware and, and another um, trying to put all the open data into VM and all and she's gonna be profiting off this and her friend and colleagues are gonna be profiting off this stuff. Um, she has zero expertise in technology. It's not so at one point I see all right, so if we have a, a representative Obama at that time that says you're capable of this position, yeah, let's appoint you, because you've done it before. Next term, we get a Charlie Baker who wants, who knows, someone that's, uh, if, you know, someone who put could a bunch of money cash dark money ways, ways, or, you know. And then say about how wonderful the economy is doing. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I just wanted to edit and say, appointment can be good, it can be bad. But I think that people would be at the right way. Yeah, and you, the people can make a better choice than a I mean, single so, person or a representative. Yeah, for me, about being in this party, especially about the way we conduct business, it's all about democracy and pushing for a real, a true democracy. Right. And any steps that we can get to get to that goal of true democracy um, is why I'm all about this. Right. Yeah, be a liquid or direct. Yeah. Like it's, the electoral college. Yeah. It's not college, it's not electoral. Well, I don't know. <laughs> what, what do we, let's focus on this. So, so, I mean, the state, the state of Mass is, is, is hurting in terms of answering FOIA requests and, and serving up open data, right? Right. Uh, it was a shocker to me. There was one meeting on IRC where Oh, yeah, Mass is rated like 40th in the in the state, in the country for, for accessing data. Took a step back and just assumed, you know, in, in this bubble where the, yeah, the amount of like intellectual people we have in the state is like one of the highest. We have we have some of the smartest people here, but they're yeah. not trying to just come up with solutions. It's very problems they can solve. Yeah, exactly. What was it? Uh, in terms of the amount of man hours that went into the game Halo, mm -hmm. would be enough to like cure cancer versus, <laughs> versus the amount of hours we put into cancer research collectively versus the amount we played on a video game within one year. It, it was monumentally small on the data, the cancer research versus video game. So the amount of man hours. It's a bit of a shocker. <laughs> I mean, then, granted, some of the people that you play those games with, you don't want them anywhere near your cancer research. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but if you have the money, then the cancer researchers will, people will move into cancer research. But yeah. yeah. And get off the video games and put their hours into All right, um, so other areas to discuss? So, economy, military, immigration. Oh, no. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I can't believe it was not open borders. 
with the threats that we face today, it is a sticky question to really go and continue the integration. Um, it's a real sticky question. I think in a safe and legal way, um, but how, do you, how do you put that? Because we're a nation of immigrants. So having having a way in which people to come over to better their lives. Shouldn't, well, I mean, we should have a really good way to field those who are coming over for their green cards, but we shouldn't make it impossible to get a green card. Nor should we make the pro, and even maybe even streamlining <coughs> the renewal of a green card if you're, if the people here are working or if the path to citizenship, if they want that too. Um, make it real easy that if they're over here, and they're working and they're making a positive impact in their our communities and they want to really integrate into our community, I most certainly want those people coming over here. You know, because they're just making this place better. At the same time, uh, I was always raised to make the place that you're in better. Even if it's only a little bit, just to make it a little bit better each time you're there will make your community that much better. So, if they're making this community better, why do we want to start? I mean, we... there, are, there are towns in the, Midwest, in the Midwest that would be that would be dying but for new immigrants. They're coming over here and doing the jobs that I don't want to do. Well, well part of that is that. also a paid thing. Right. If we, if we had a high, uh, if we had a higher minimum wage or a living wage, then. Um, yeah. But that. Well, that's not true. It's not one hundred percent true because I'm willing to do anything for twenty dollars. But uh, <clears throat> twenty bucks, twenty bucks. But a couple of other things to bring up is one of the reasons that you have immigrants coming in, particularly from certain countries, is economic and political circumstances right. such that they have no place else to go. It's either stay and starve or come or get shot. Yeah, or get shot. Um, the other is is that we're now in the current political climate, we're we're becoming so the government is becoming so vehemently anti-immigrant. Let me give you an idea: is there was a, um, an Episcopal priest, Anglican priest from um, England, who settled here, served at church. Um, he had gotten his residence card, and he then went and got his um, driver's license. And this, this was like 20 years ago, and the person at the DMV said, you want to register to vote, just sort of automatically. And he said, um, okay. I didn't think I, and then he voted on something like a bond issue. But because, even though he didn't vote on it, there was also on the ballot, um, and election for House of Representatives, he had technically violated federal law so that when he applied for citizenship, they not only denied it, they immediately moved to deport him. So like you said, if we take into account how is this individual contributing to the community, which he had in spades, shouldn't that override a technical legal violation and say, okay, you made this mistake you didn't do it again when you learned that it, it, it was illegal for you to vote in the first place. We're going to overlook that, and given the contribution you made to the community, we're going to. Wouldn't that be a small thing, though? I mean, they yeah. could just melt his vote. His vote. Well, and the vote might have, the vote might have, you know, it might have been ten years ago or twenty years ago. Twenty oh, twenty years ago. Twenty years ago. But under Trump and with. ICE, you've got that he's being deported. Yeah, I mean, I, I, certainly for, for immigrants, I'll, I'll point out to this country was founded on the no taxation without representation, as I said before. So it, it strikes me that if, if you're an immigrant here and you are taxed, just at a local level and maybe a state level, um, we can argue federal, but you should be able to vote, right? Citizenship does confer certain 
additional benefits, um, and we can square what that is. But if you're paying taxes, you have you should have some right to control who your representatives are. And also, as far as getting deported, um, I think recently it became a bit more streamlined, and it should be a legal process to get deported. It shouldn't be just some quick, hey, you. Oh. Yeah, this is actually affecting a lot of people right. because if you if you're trying to redo your visa or uh, extend, uh, basically make any change to your, your immigration status, uh, if that change is denied, you are immediately on the fast track for deportation exactly. without without any uh, additional process. So no tax that you want representation, yeah. semicolon, uh, limited slash local voting rights. I would say limited, uh, limited. Uh, rights or limited voted rights automatically as its own separate because local local rights I mean they're already a part of their communities and ability to um, have a say in those communities I come from a very strong Cambodian and Brazilian community in our area uh, and Portuguese and uh, Puerto Rican and all those different cultures mesh in well whereas uh, people who aren't necessarily from it still come to that community, to my community, and still make positive impacts day in and day out. And whether whether they're just volunteers at your local at the local Y or stuff like that, they're still vibrant members of our community, and should be accorded some basic human rights and respects, you know, including a voice to make that community better. <laughs> right? Don't we have do we have treaties in regards to asylum seekers that we are completely promoting? Honor agreements regarding asylum seekers. And, and treat them with dignity. <laughs> well, that's part of the agreements. <laughs> to another. So say somebody comes over here for a student visa, make it streamlined whereas if they came over here for a student visa and say they get uh, a science degree, streamline it so that they can go and immediately get a working visa. Uh, so that streamline that process. Oh, you already have that one? Here, turn that one in, you get this one. Instead that, of the opposite. Instead of, yeah, <laughs> yeah instead of. Yeah, like, yeah. oh, we'll kick you out and then resend you. Congratulations, you have your diploma and your ticket. Yeah, yeah. So, like, we, we train, we've, and a lot of companies too have an uh, issue with this. A lot of the big companies, like the pharmaceutical companies, who will bring in somebody, train them, and then they get sent home and they have to re bring them yeah. back in. Where instead of just streamlining it, they train them to be able and get them a degree just so that they could do this job that. They, we've sent overseas for all this time. Is the more cost is done to do that. Visa, if a student comes from overseas, their visa might say, uh, on, like, on their passport, if they're, on their papers, it might say, if you're going to be learning science or health or whatever, you must come back to your country to then, for like a minimum number of years, to, to, to contribute back to uh, Right, that's a requirement. Country that you're, you're imposed. By, by their their process, their 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 yeah. Right, but that's not like, yeah. that doesn't affect us. I mean, if they have to go back, well, then they have to we, go, we go back, and then we'll have to, that do, we'll have to deal with the, yeah. the no, real problem. No, it does. It doesn't affect us. So, okay. if, yeah. if a bunch of students come to, to become doctors in Boston, and then they leave, it sucks. I would rather give them citizenship right. if they want it, yeah. but they're gonna they want to and but their families are going to pay them. full freight, so their country's going to pay full freight on that. Mm -hmm. We charge those students it's exorbitant amounts of money. I'm okay so, with charging Mexico with the wall. I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm not, I'm not making just value good. judgments. I'm just saying that, like the bad joke. you know, yeah. they they go, that 
if, if they had if someone's paying for it and it was not in the US and there are conditions that they have to go back, well those supersede whatever. But if they don't have those conditions, you know, why why make it hard? I mean if there's something we can do to I guess encourage people to come here um, with like somehow free of these restrictions on thing, I don't know. Yeah, it's more of like yeah. it's I mean First, to get into the states, you have to prove that you have assets back at home, that you will return back to your home. And this is like tourist visas, you know. Right. So it's, if you have no assets or you're just visiting New York City, you can be turned around. You say, well, you, you might Depends on the country, right? If you're from Germany, it does, probably it doesn't, doesn't matter. matter yeah. Right? It's, yeah, there's definitely, if you're from Venezuela and you're just on a flight to New York City, you could get turned around from Germany. Maybe. Depending on also how you're applying, because with a, just a visiting visa, that, that, that's different than, or just a, a visiting pass, it's different than if you're coming here as a student, different than if you're coming here to work. Um, one of the guys who works for me has a working visa from Puerto Rico. I think it's Puerto Rico. Could have been, no, it's, no, it's, yes, he need a visa. I'm sorry, he's Dominican. He's, he's Dominican. So he has a working visa to be over here. and. Uh, Guy's guy's amazing actually, and I'm glad I'm having him. But he go every time he has to renew that. It's such a headache, such a headache. So being able to renew, uh, renew those visas, because he's happy being a citizen of the Dominican. He's and happy sending his. He works hard all the time, and he sends his money home. And so and go, then, online. Hmm? go online and website just like I did with uh, changing my party destination. Be able to go on and say, fill out the form online, send it in, and yep, pay your fine or pay what you have to yeah, pay. Yeah, pay it by PayPal or credit card or whatever. So, so abolish ice? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, you know, I, I think something could be done with the TSA as well. Oh, uh, but no. that's just my opinion. <laughs> So abolish ICE reform TSA. <laughs> abolish ICE reform TSA. Reform? <laughs> Radical reform? Uh, do they even actually do anything? Have, have they stopped anybody from? They take pocket knives. They have, and fingernail clippers <laughs> and toothpaste. They've taken lots and lots of toothpaste. Or is it you never know what you can do with all that fluoride? You know, yeah, yeah, you know. So we're going to be back there in the back of the point of the little lab set. Um, yeah, it's actually doesn't, what is it, sense of safety? The sense of safety as opposed to actually being safe? Uh, no more security <laughs> theater. Those guys can go and get jobs at normal security firms like everybody else. They get paid. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm. I'm yeah, yeah, not as much. Probably paying. Your position in it. <coughs> no, we should all fly you. Maybe that's a solution. <coughs> I'm sure there would be a group out there that will support that. Yeah. There's a science fiction story I read about how. Um, Americans had perfected the neutron bomb and destroy all living tissue and leave them. Trains and cars and so forth intact, whereas the Soviet Union created the, what they called the socialist bomb, which destroyed property but left human beings alive and intact. And the only really fatalities was when you had, they detonated the bombs and airplanes that were in the air disintegrate along with the people's clothes. So you had thousands of naked people falling into the <laughs> it's really men <laughs> <laughs> and children. I don't know, I, 
I feel I feel like that's kind of the same thing with punish the Johns, mm -hmm. right. not the. But there's the. There's what are you trying much to achieve? What's, what are you trying to achieve? Stop your exploitation of people. Right. And you're leveraging ICE to. Well, you know, you, I don't have to pay this week. I mean, you're using, I'll call ICE to call the yeah. Right. Yeah, you certainly you, you want to go after the employers. Well, that's that's what the that's, employers know, though. I and mean, you have to prove that the employers knew that they were illegal. Because a lot of the times, being an employer myself, somebody could easily take those out. Well, how about immunity for undocumented immigrants reporting crimes against them? I think that a predecessor of Mark yeah. Healy yeah. actually had that as a policy at the AG's office. That if an undocumented immigrant in uh, Massachusetts was a victim of any kind of crime, they would not turn them into immigration authorities, they would not prosecute them for violating immigration. So, so after, after they were assaulted, if they were robbed, if they were the victim of their labor exploitation, that's what they would do. So essentially, immunity or immigrants, uh, legal or otherwise, would still have authorization. Immigrants document. Immun yeah, immunity for immigrants, whether they're legal or not, for reporting crimes. So a good example of that is for all the people who are running, running down the border down. Uh, in the Texas line. Um, so what we're trying to discuss here is uh, basically the immunity for reporting crime. So if somebody's an illegal immigrant, they they won't be prosecuted for for things. If, if an undocumented immigrant is the victim of a crime and they report the crime, they themselves would not be prosecuted for uh, their undocumented status. So they don't have to fear. Exactly. I think this was something, yeah. I think it was Tom Riley, yeah. uh, former state AG, who had in instituted that policy under his uh, tenure as Attorney General. I don't know. I feel like if we, if we have a way of people being legit, but not the, the not the right word. If people are being documented. If we have a way that people who come here have, have a way that's of being documented that's not onerous. But so actually, no, yeah, because that we, yeah, no, that's fine. That's, no, that's, that's, that's a long term yeah. goal. No, no, this would yeah, be an yeah. intermediate goal. This would be the patch to right. get us to that point. Right. Well, as that, many sex worker advocates have said, as, as an intermediate goal to decrim is do not prosecute sex workers or their clients for being. For, for engaging in commercial sex, if they're reporting a crime uh, that happened to them or that occurred while they were uh, doing that activity. All of their kind of harm reduction. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, Basically, so prioritize enforcement is the term that's used. Okay. But I, I feel like Trump is moving to, I mean, Trump even is going after legal yeah. immigration yeah. to make that harder. Um, ICE has ICE has manuals for how do you get someone who's become legally a citizen, how can you go after them to remove their citizenship? Also as an intermediary to abolish ICE and make Massachusetts a sanctuary state. How do we feel about being a sanctuary? Or sanctuary state. Makes it stronger. Mm -hmm. There we go. Make Massachusetts a sanctuary state. You know, New York City, Long Island, supposed to be a sanctuary state. And you know, you hear stories of uh, taxi cab drivers that were harassed by the police because of their status, and the judge is like, "Get this out of here! You can't." arrest someone because of their stat. It doesn't work that way. You can't be harassing me with tickets. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, but then, a year later, there's children prisons. Right? The, the ice box was in New York or whatever. And so there needs to be more <clears throat> accountability for officials that know there's shady stuff going on and they're 
Oklahoma City. Uh, is, it, is it Blumenthal? Is it, or is it not Blumenthal? Uh, Bloom, Bloomberg? The mayor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah Bloomberg was the mayor. Bloomberg was like, I can't believe this. Like, you might have the resources to find out if it is happening. So there has to be some. Well, if, you, if we go to the criminal justice, we have some uh, party planks in there about reform of law enforcement, including you know, community policing, civilian oversight, et cetera. Community policing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was, sorry, we already have that before. We do. Yeah, I think so. Policing thing. How about end cops being above the law? And every, <laughs> well, I'm just thinking. You know, just cop, a cop goes and kills somebody, mm -hmm. and it's oh well. They were what was the Supreme Court verdict that because they were carrying out their job, they get qualified immunity. Okay. I think it's done by mm -hmm. case by case basis. Oh. All corrupt and abusive cops accountable. Wow. I would say no one is above the law. No, Unfortunately, I, that's not the case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, if, if we catch somebody who's, no matter what their status is, like, for example, Bill, Bill Cosby going to jail, mm -hmm. um, no matter who you are, if you're committing crimes, no one's above the law. Well, I think in terms of how about this, do not break the law to enforce the law. Okay, where's an example? Mom, um, trying to get the mafia or like, stuff like that. Viol violating uh, uh, Bill of Rights protections against self-incrimination, mm -hmm. uh, using physical force to extract confessions. Uh, um, I'm racial profiling, et cetera. Broadly, I'm thinking of um, a number of the things that the FBI did while they were investigating Whitey Bulger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or just to get in close to Whitey Bulger. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're at about four o'clock and um, I think next thing up was lightning talks. I don't know, does anyone get, want to give a lightning talk? Sure. I mean, do you want to take a break from this? Yeah, let's take let's take five and then. Uh... And we will be back to you soon. Um, I.